you. All right, let me get my screen shared here and uh, we'll, we'll get this going. All right, uh, quick, just a quick verbal confirmation. Can you uh, see my screen? Okay. Yes, you are good to go. All right. <laughs> well, I do realize I'm the only thing standing between this group and lunch. So let's make this uh, fun and let's also get into some, uh, some, some interesting things that I think are going to impact um, production ag, not only here in the state of Tennessee, but also all, all over the U.S. So we're going to cover a lot just to kind of give, give us some perspective on how weather is going to impact what we do. So, of course, a couple of days ago was Groundhog's Day. I think we're all pretty well aware of that. It's kind of a funny holiday, isn't it? You know, we, 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 on February 2nd, we yank this creature out of a cage uh, that has absolutely no predictive skill, and we ask it its opinion of the weather. And for some reason, we just seem to trust and love the old groundhog forecast. Now, personally, I think it's a great holiday. I have a good time with it. Uh, but uh, remember, this animal, um, uh, two things about it. Uh, one, it uh, probably doesn't know what its shadow is. And, and number two, it should be, um, you know, it should be hibernating this time of year. And uh, it's just kind of a fun way to, <laughs> to think about the groundhog. Now, one of my favorite jokes for all meteorologists out there is people always say this, oh, you got the best job in the world. You, you can be wrong 50% of the time and still keep your job. Well, you know, we've kept the groundhog employed for 135 years. <laughs> we've been doing this. And uh, his accuracy rating, 38%. That's straight from Noah. They've been studying it for a while. And uh, he loves to predict more winter. That's, that's the preferred mode uh, for the groundhog here. Now, for me, the ground, Groundhog's Day is just an excellent excuse to watch one of my favorite movies. I, I, love, I love the movie Groundhog's Day. And this is just uh, from Teal Cartoons, one of my favorite scenes. You know, Ned Ryerson, when Bill Murray turns around and decks him, I think it's one of the best parts of the whole movie. And then now I'm a, I'm a classic car, classic truck kind of guy. So when I see Bill Murray and the Groundhog driving that 1971 C10. It hurts a little bit when they drive it over the cliff, uh, that's, uh, but that, that, there you go. All right, we're not gonna talk about the Groundhog all day because we got bigger fish to fry. And uh, it starts here. This is what the last 30 days has looked like up to Groundhog's Day. And the map is showing you temperature anomalies and anomalies just simply mean differences from normal. And what we notice here is this is not what was expected for winter 2020 to 2021 up to this point. And that is very, very warm conditions up to 15 to 20 degrees above average to part of the Canadian prairie. And honestly, across much of the lower 48, uh, a real void of sustained cold air. And uh, that, that is, like I said, not what we were expecting this year. Where all that cold air, I just shifted the map a little bit for you here. All that cold air has been here in parts of Russia, or it's been in Kazakhstan, Mongolia, China. It's been on the other side of the, of the hemisphere. And uh, spending all that time there in January just allowed this mild air to come into the lower 48. And that is until we get past this weekend. You see, the map you're now looking at shows you maximum temperatures next Wednesday. And if you look there, you see a lot of single digits in northern plains in the upper Midwest. We see across the state of Tennessee that our temperatures going west to east, while they'll be much colder than average, uh, we're going to be in the 30s for high temperatures. In my home state of Illinois, I'm right here with the 16 is in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we're going to be pretty chilly here as well. And this cold air outbreak that we're about to witness has not yet been seen so far this winter. And as I saw it, it reminded me of one of my favorite books. And if you'll give me five minutes. I'm going to tell you a story about this. Now, I don't know if you've read this book. This book was given to me about 10 years ago. This lady, a good friend of mine, she says, hey, you need to read this. It's about weather. And I'm like, oh, I read books about weather all the time. I don't want She goes, no, just read it. She gave it to me on a Sunday morning right after church. I went home that afternoon and I didn't put it down until I finished it. And I remember one very specific story in this book about a little boy named Walter. And I'm going to tell you his story real quick. You see, back in 1888, this was a family that had moved to North Dakota. They were from Northern Europe and they were homesteaders. They were given 160 acres, they plowed it up and they were growing. While they were there, that particular winter, the winter of 1888 was brutal to start off. But then in mid-January, in, in fact, on January 12th, 1888, the temperatures climbed. I mean, they shot up into the low forties. And kids in the Northern Plains, pioneer kids who had not been to school in weeks, knew that the school was open and they were on their way to school that day. And there was one little boy named Walter who woke up that morning in his soddy. Remember learning about that? They lived in these soddies, these houses made out of dirt. Well, he woke up and he said, mom, I got to go to school. And mom said, sure. Now, the reason why Walter wanted to go to school so bad was he was a row monitor. And when he left, he grabbed his most prized possession. Now, 
Walter's mother had given him a family heirloom, which Walter's mother had gotten from her mother. And what it was, was a tiny little perfume bottle. And what Walter kept in there was no longer any perfume, that had all dried up, but he kept water in there. And he would take it to school so that after he did his assignments on his piece of slate, he could then use his perfume bottle to spray water on it and clean his piece of slate off. So he grabs it on his way out, heads off to school. Now, children all over the Northern Plains did that this day. What was amazing was there was no weather service, no one there to tell them what was coming out of the Canadian prairie, much like what's coming out of the Canadian prairie right now. You see, it was one of these massive, massive blizzards. The temperature was going to start off in the upper 40s and finish below zero. And the cold air that was coming in here was accompanied by a tremendous amount of snow, as you can see in some of these pictures. And the snow was so thick that they say in the book that a full-grown man couldn't see his outstretched hand, couldn't shout in the wind to yell at his neighbor. It was such a fierce blizzard. And all of these kids, Walter included, were stuck at school in the middle of the day. And for some reason, I have yet to learn the history of this. But all of the schoolhouses were built about a mile away from town. So they couldn't get home. And they were trapped. Now, very luckily, as this blizzard came in, and this is just, these are just some pictures of what it was like, a, a group of men from the local town hitched up some horses and some wagons and they followed the grooves under the snow of the old mud tracks from the fall. And they got out to the school because they couldn't see anything in this blizzard. And when they got there, well, this is kind of what the conditions were like. And you can see it here in this video. It was blinding, but the teacher, the kids were just ecstatic to be picked up and to be rescued. Now, Walter, he was a row monitor, which means he was in charge of his grade. He made sure that all the kids in his grade got on the back of that wagon. And as it took off, he remembered that he forgot one very important thing, and that was grandma's perfume bottle. You see, if you'd have left it in the schoolhouse where it was going to instantly freeze, it would, the water would expand, break the perfume bottle, and that family heirloom would be lost and broken. So he jumps off the wagon just as he's pulling out of the school, runs back in, grabs it, and when he comes back out, the wagon was gone. In the snowstorm, was so blinding, little Walter could not see the, the wagon anymore. Now, he tried to start to run, but the temperatures were already down to near zero Fahrenheit on a 50, get that, a 50 mile an hour wind, which means the wind chills, the wind chills that he was dealing with were close to like minus 30, 40, 50 degrees. Now, when Walter left for school that morning, he did not take with him his normal coat, hat, gloves, the stuff he would normally take. And instead, what he took was just a over like a big sweater and his galoshes and he ran out the door. Well, now he was wishing he had these because as he was chasing after that cart, his body temperature dropped three degrees in about five minutes and he went into moderate hypothermia. While in moderate hypothermia, he began to shiver so violently that it be, became very difficult for him to walk. And he, as soon as that began to happen, he couldn't make his hands into a fist and he didn't have much control over his legs. Not 10 minutes later, he was going into the next stage of hypothermia when his body temperature, get this, was just down to about 93, 94 degrees. And as it got down that cold, all of the blood, well, stopped going to the extremities and came into his interior, kept his heart going, kept his brain going, but Walter could no longer walk. And he fell down into the snow and he started to crawl because as he fell, his knees and hands landed on one of those frozen mud tracks. And he crawled another 200 yards over the next hour toward home but Walter's body temperature dropped into the 80s and eventually into the 70s. And little Walter began to dip in and out of consciousness, but he remembered one thing right before he lost consciousness. And that was that dad had told him that if he ever gets caught in one of these blizzards, get out of the wind, get yourself in a shelter. And if that shelter snow, get under the snow. And that's what little Walter did. He buried himself in the snow and left one little ungloved hand sticking up above the snow so that if his dad or older brother were to come find him, they'd know exactly where to look. And he laid there for hours. And his body temperature continued to drop into the 70s, like I said, and even into the 60s. And Walter lost consciousness. Now, his older brother, Will, did eventually find him. And his dad was right there behind him. And as soon as they found little Walter, his dad ripped open his shirt to expose his chest. And he put his ear right up to his chest. And he did that so that he could attempt to hear if his son was breathing or if his heart was beating. But you see, when your body temperature drops off like that, your heart slows and your breathing slows. And it was 25 seconds between each heartbeat. 
And his dad waited there agonizing just over that next heartbeat. But when he heard it, took off back home. He did not immediately warm Walter up because if he did that, all of the blood would try to leave and go back to the extremities where it would stay. It would never come back. The capillaries were too constricted. Instead, what he did was for the next two hours, took off his clothes right behind the barn out of the wind, took his son's clothes off and then just sat there and held him using his own body heat to warm his boy up. And it took a while. A little Walter slowly began to regain consciousness. And when he stared back at his dad's eyes, not with a vacant stare, but a stare that showed that he was alive and well, then dad rushed him inside and warmed him up. Now, what's amazing about this story is that Walter actually lived to be 93 years old and somehow survived this without permanent damage, especially from the hypothermia or the frostbite. But what an amazing story about what to do when a high impact meteorology event like a blizzard takes over the Northern Plains. Now we got a blizzard today. Are you ready for this? It's right here in the state of Iowa. Thank goodness it's a long ways away from Tennessee because the winds that are coming through Iowa today and the snow that's coming in is gonna be brutal. We've got very cold temperatures. If there's a wind chill warning in North Dakota, it's ridiculously cold. And that cold air is gonna come in. Watch this with me in this animation. It's gonna come in behind this big snowstorm. See it going through parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, into the Great Lakes states. That's the first round of cold that's sweeping through. But the big round of cold is coming in behind it after this weekend. And it's born on this big high pressure system right here. And I hope you could see this animation quickly enough, but that's what's going on. Now, I wanna show it to you, ready? So I'm gonna pause this right here. And what we're gonna notice is that into early next week, as this high pressure system comes sliding in, what I'm worried about for the state of Tennessee will be next Tuesday morning, because we could be right here, right here in this area, dealing with some freezing rain as the nose of that cold air sneaks in. And by next Wednesday into Thursday and Friday, it's gonna be very, very cold. And I'm gonna tell you something, I'm watching carefully next Friday for the development of a low along the coast. And I know right now you don't see the map advertising snow up in part of Tennessee, but it's a real possibility getting out that far that we could have a coastal low that runs up the East Coast and really hits us hard. All of this was born out of the Canadian prairie and it's coming down as a 1050 high right here. Now that is anomalous weather and it is gonna send us over into a pattern that is gonna remind us here in the midsection of the country exactly what winter is capable of because we need a bit of a reminding after how warm it's been. Let me show you these temperatures, are you ready? Here's today's temperatures, it is mild. I'm sorry that I'm keeping you in a conference today, but let me show you something. As we work our way through Friday and into Saturday and then Sunday, Monday, look at this, ready? Tuesday, Wednesday, these are high temperatures and we're comparing them to normal here, showing you that we're gonna be upwards of 20 to 25 degrees below normal. And it's gonna last for a while, all the way up through day five through 10 in this forecast, right? So this gets us up to the 14th, this is through Valentine's Day. We have just unlocked this brutally cold Arctic air that is coming down, compliments of Alaska, the Canadian Prairie. And about the only thing I wanna watch carefully is the fact that there'll be a little ridge over parts of Florida. And in between the two, right where I just do that last line, could be a bit of a battleground for weather systems, which is why I told you I'm a little concerned about Tennessee and south of Tennessee going into the Valentine's Day weekend. So to show you what is also gonna happen, these are the temperatures forecast, not for the surface air temperature, but the four inch soil temperature, 6 a.m. on the 15th. Right now, now this could change, but right now we're expecting that freezing line to get pretty far to the south. Right across the state of Tennessee, we could have our soil temperatures at four inches well into the 20s. Here in this part of the country, below zero. Very, very cold air coming in, and it looks as though it's going to last us through mid-month. This is the day 10 through 15 forecast, which gets us all the way up to the 19th of the month. We once again see that we're going to have multiple shots of colder air coming in out of the Canadian prairie during that time. From there, I'm going to show you what changed. You see, up until this point for December and January, the jet stream came screaming off of Japan and just broke over the mountains just like that. And because of that, we got a lot of mild Pacific air that came into the US. In other words, nothing came out of the Hudson Bay. Nothing came straight north. It just kind of flowed across from west to east, never really given us that, uh, that those deep penetrating shots of colder air. But today, I would like to show you where the air is coming from across the northern plains of the United States. So if you look right here, 
and then trace things back, you will see that the flow is coming around this high pressure cell over the Arctic, down through the Canadian archipelago, and is targeting the state of Iowa today. That's right, we call this cross polar flow because the cold air that we're about to witness here in the Midwestern part of the United States came originally from Siberia. And that is what winter is capable of doing. It was helped along by the polar vortex. And if you've seen me present in the last few years, I have shown this example every time because it is a classic example of how this works. If you hate winter, you want the image on the left strong polar vortex, keeping all that really cold air right over the North Pole. But if the polar vortex splits and a piece of it comes over here to the Hudson Bay, we get locked into cold like we saw back in January 2019. This young lady in Minneapolis, Minnesota went outside, put a pair of her pants in water, threw them up at minus 30 degree weather. They froze in mid-flight and perfectly stuck the landing. That's the kind of cold we're talking about when the polar vortex is split. And I'm gonna get nerdy here and show you exactly what it looks like. You're in the stratosphere here, way up above the surface of the earth. And what I'm gonna play for you is, I want you to watch the reds. You see the reds sitting over the North Pole, that is the displacement. And what it displaced is the polar vortex right here by the time we get to Valentine's Day, sitting on top of the Hudson Bay. And that is the main source of the brutally cold air that will be coming into the lower 48 from now through the next 15 days. Now, in Tennessee, you've got a few more days before you have to deal with this. I'm not very excited about my state of Illinois here. And I gave a talk the other day in North Dakota, and they are really not excited about this at all. We are even getting support from this pattern out of the tropics. You see, there's something that we watch in atmospheric sciences called the MJO. Now today, don't worry about what it means, but we watch it in all of its different phases. And historically, if the MJO is in phase six or phase seven, it just lets cold air out of the Canadian prairie and pushes the warm air over the Southeast away. And that's what we're about to witness with this upcoming pattern. Now I told you earlier, we did not expect this. In fact, if you heard me present earlier on in fall, I said, you know what, with the La Nina that's gonna be peaking in January, we should expect throughout winter, big intrusions of colder air to come out of Canada. But we just didn't see it. We did get the wetter conditions at times. And yeah, it's been dry in the Southwest and there's been quite a bit of snow in the Northwest, but we just have not seen this cold air until now. This is what we typically get when there is a La Nina. So for the first time all winter long, the atmosphere is behaving as we had finally expected it would be doing for the last several weeks. Now this La Nina is gonna be a big piece of what I'm about to forecast for you. So I wanna share what we're worried about for the rest of winter. I wanna talk about spring and summer, and I wanna to get to this idea about what the La Nina is gonna do, how the La Nina is gonna change, and what it means for our weather pattern. So you ready? La Nina. First animation starts on July the 1st, you ready? And it goes through mid-January. The La Nina event is happening here. It's the cold ocean temperatures that you see emerging in the central Pacific Ocean. Now those cold ocean temperatures that you see there are the result of what we call strong trade winds. And it just turns out that every so often, the atmosphere meanders between El Nino and La Nina. El Ninos occur when the water warms up. La Ninas occur, look over there on the right, when the waters cool off. Now, across North America, we actually prefer El Ninos more than anything. And the reason why, especially during our summer, is that El Ninos are loosely correlated with wetter summer conditions. La Ninas, all that moisture goes back over to Australia, Indonesia, Southeast Asia. We tend to be drier in both North and South America, and I will talk about South America and their issues in just a few moments. So with that as the backdrop, I wanna let you know, we've got a long history of learning about El Nino and La Nina. This is every single one of the events since 1950. Our most recent La Nina, when it was cold, was down here in 2010 and 2011. The most recent big El Nino was 2015, 2016. And we're currently sitting right down here. See it? Into a moderate, practically strong La Nina event. Okay, with that, here is a bit of meteorology 101 for you, all right? When you get home, I want you telling everybody at the dinner table that this is what you learned today. La Nina, what does it do? it robs westward momentum. You see the jet stream meanders north and south, and every time it builds into a big ridge, which is when it sends north, ah, when that happens, we tend to get hot and dry. When La Nina creates a jet stream pattern that dips down far south, 
into deep troughs, which is what we're about to experience, okay? That's when things get cold and unsettled. Why we like El Nino so much is because this is what it does. It sends the jet stream much more zonal, more west-east flowing very quickly across the lower 48. We get more routine weather systems. And boy, California wants nothing more than an El Nino right now to cure their longstanding drought problems. That's what El Nino and La Nina do. They affect the jet stream. Even though they happen thousands of miles away, they affect the jet stream. And I want to show you exactly what the underlying state of this El Nino, or excuse me, this La Nina did to 2020. So take a look at it here. This is January 1st to December 31st, 2020. And when you look at it, there's a number inside of every climate reporting district. And that number represents the rank on the 129 years worth of data we have across the United States. And your eye sees it as well as I do. The Southeast to parts of the Mid-South, right on the state of Tennessee, it was very, very wet. The Southwest, extremely dry. And tucked in the middle here in the primary corn and soybean belt, we had flash drought like I've never seen. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. The look at the eastern side of Tennessee, see those number ones? The wettest year on record, 2020. Now, when we think about this, let me show you how the jet stream responded. Let's apply the, the lesson I just taught you. You see, in the middle of summer, a big ridge set up. I'll put an H over it right there over the west. And the flow went around it like that. Now we call that flow ring of fire. And it means ring of fire in this case for two reasons. Number one, there was a lot of storms run on the periphery of this, but those storms produced rain that never got to the ground. They were dry. What did get to the ground though was lightning and it ignited a lot of fires. What you see here was on Labor Day weekend, watch the smoke at the end of this satellite emission covering the Western part of the United States. Under that ridge, we saw 8.2 million acres, and that's a record, 8.2 million acres of ground burned in the Western United States. I'll show you in particular this fire right here in Colorado because we flew next to it. This was the Cameron Peak Fire. Smoke from that fire spread across Kansas, hit Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, went over Indiana, Ohio, and actually made it all the way to the Northeast and out into the North Atlantic. We found smoke from the Cameron Peak Fire 5,000 miles away from where the fire was in Colorado. On Labor Day weekend, the winds shifted and came out of the east and blanketed uh, San Francisco with smoke. And it was so much smoke that it blotted out the midday sun and the street lamps came on. And all you got out of this was a hazy red sunshine. Incredible to see the impact of that. But what made us so wet was the fact that the Bermuda High wasn't over Bermuda. You see, Bermuda's right here. The Bermuda High shifted a bit to the east, and it was just this near constant guide all summer long for tropical cyclones to come into the Southeast and get all the way up with their moisture in the state of Tennessee. We flew into every one of them with our hurricane hunters. A record number of hurricane reconnaissance flights. He's one of the squiggly lines on here is where we flew into our hurricane. Incredible to see how frequent we had to do this because this was a year where we completely exhausted our normal name list and went deep into the Greek alphabet. In fact, we had 30 name systems, meaning that the last one had the ninth letter in the Greek alphabet and it was IOTA. But this is an IOTA, this is Hurricane Laura, which hit Louisiana first before spreading its moisture across the state of Tennessee. Now, when it hit Tennessee, it hit, or excuse me, when it hit Louisiana, it hit hard. There was a radar there in Lake Charles that was completely destroyed by the winds on the Northern side of Hurricane Laura's eyewall. You see, normally there's a large dish on top of that pedestal covered by a radome, which protects the dish. You can't protect it against 138 mile an hour winds. The last image we got was this one at the Lake Charles radar, which is right here because the northern edge of that eye wall brought in those 138 mile an hour winds. And by the way, using Doppler technology, we knew that about a thousand feet above the ground, winds were 170 miles an hour. By the middle of the season, remember the hurricane season peaks in mid-September. We were looking at Sally, Paulette, Renee, Vicky, Teddy. Why were they all there? La Nina's in the Pacific allow for low wind shear environments in the Atlantic which allows hurricanes to thrive. We were almost out of names at this point and we were only halfway done. And if you've never seen it before, I would like to show you a video of what it's like to ride along with the hurricane hunters. I've got a chance to do this. I've been on the hurricane hunter before. Hurricane Epsilon about to do an eyewall penetration here, 10,000 feet, there you go, you just flew into the eyewall. The pilot's gonna steer to the center of circulation. We're gonna drop an instrument pack. And with that instrument pack, we'll be able to collect vital amounts of information 
about what this hurricane is doing and where it's going. Put it all together though, and look at each one of the tropical systems that cut through the Southeast up into the Tennessee Valley and the Ohio River Valley at time. Laura was the bad one right there. There goes Omar, you can see the rest of them. Sally, Beta came through all of these different tropical systems. The last one at the United States was Hurricane Ada, just an incredible year here. But when it was all said and done, look at how it split the country. Through February 4th, this just came out this morning, we stopped 60%, 60% of the United States is still in some form of drought. But as you now know, it's the Western United States and the Northern Plains that have the most drought. It's amazing to see that lately, we have stayed on the drought monitor in the state of Tennessee, given how wet it was in 2020. We're just there in the first stage, but we're gonna keep a close eye on this as we go forward. Now, I wanna teach you about flash drought, just five minutes of it here. Because in the middle of this year, think a broader picture here about the whole of the corn and soybean belt. Look at these statewide precipitation ranks, especially in Nebraska, which was its driest on record, Iowa third driest, and the state of Illinois 13th driest. So while the Southeast was getting hammered, the Midwest was going through an extended time period here of very dry conditions. Now we monitor this by looking at four inch soil moisture values. This comes from NASA. So 10, 10 centimeters is the same as four inches. And we're looking at percentages. So you can see down here, this would be the two to 10% range. Already in the state of Iowa, we were dry by mid July. And as we go forward throughout the rest of that month, let me just see what happens as we get into the month of August. You see through middle and end of August, while we continue to see big storm systems cranking out here with each one of these hurricanes, flash drought on the northern edge of it, from northern Iowa into parts of Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, uh, excuse me, Ohio, then Il uh, Iowa, South Dakota, Nebraska. By the end of the month, we had soil moisture values in the top four inches here that were below 2%. Now, we did get at the very beginning of September, a big system that cut through right there but look at it come right back on through September and into October, such that by middle October, we were exceptionally dry during the harvest time period right in through here. And that posed a major safety hazard for us because in my home state of Illinois, my good friend, Chad Colby was out flying his Cessna. Look at the uh, field scar right here that was burned with a fire we had as we were trying to get this crop harvested in the middle of October. And then here's this picture, Southeastern South Dakota, a fire ran through this field, and as it did so, burned everything except for what was left of the stalk in the ear. And what was amazing about this is the guy went ahead and decided to try to harvest this, and he reported, it was kind of a fun joke here, but he said, hey, I got it in at 3% moisture. Problem was it was cooked. Now, it's been good for me because I showed my kids this picture, and I use it as a teaching point to let them know that field corn is not popcorn. So even though we got this all cooked, it did not pop. Unfortunately, a lot of it was ruined. We had some crazy severe weather this year, but a lot of it was north. It's not to say we didn't have it through the state of Tennessee, but some of the worst conditions like this tornado here in Grand Forks was where some of the nastiest severe weather went. Here's a tornado intercept by my good, uh, by a guy I know here named Michael Martz. Michael caught the backside of this supercell and what he was watching here was a rapidly rotating rope, just like a drill press right here into the soybean field. Now, my advice to Michael is never get this close again. He is about 80 yards from that circulation. He could have been hit with debris. Very scary situation. Did you notice though this year, a lot of our storms like the one we had here on the 11th of July came out of the Northwest. The reason why they did that was because we had a lot of big high pressure cells in the West and the flow comes clockwise around them just like this. And these storms as they came racing out of the Northwest were flattening cornfields across Illinois like this one taken in Pontiac. And of course we cannot forget the massive derecho event that happened on August 10th. So here you are watching a radar animation. The morning of August 10th, storms were born out of South Dakota right there, cut through Eastern Nebraska, formed into a long squall line through part of Iowa, then got into Illinois, Southern Wisconsin, finished over in Indiana and Michigan. Along its way, this derecho event, which is basically just a long damaging squall line, did just that. It destroyed a lot of prime corn and soybean ground in the state of Iowa and Illinois. Cedar Rapids, Iowa saw wind gusts between 80 and 130 miles an hour. And as this all went through, it destroyed infrastructure and it laid corn flat. You can see here this damaged picture over there on the right. 
this first Saturday after this event, I did get some satellite reconnaissance of this particular event. And I was able to identify 8.5 million acres that were damaged or destroyed by this derecho. But estimates are now as high as 14 million acres that had or some level of impact uh, by this particular derecho. Good question about derechos came up last week. So how often do these happen? The last time we saw one this big through this part of the Midwest, was uh, back in 2011, so about, about 10 years. That would be the return period given the most recent event. But as you go farther to the south and east over Kentucky, Tennessee, then head toward the Appalachian Mountains and get yourself into the Carolinas, they have much more frequent squall line events that come through doing a lot of wind damage like you see here. So how do we predict it? The vast majority of our weather forecasting is done with numerical weather prediction. And I rewound the clock here back to the 25th 26th and 27th of January to show you that event that rolled through bringing in some severe weather very close to us in Tennessee and that tornado that was well forecast honestly for severe weather down there in Alabama. Now I'm not sure if you got to see this in the news but there was a gentleman here who very wisely left his NOAA radio on that night because in the middle of the night in that part of Alabama when the tornado formed his radio went off he was sleeping here his wife was sleeping there and their child was in the play yard. He woke them all up. They ran to get to shelter and not a few minutes later, that tornado tossed a two by six through their wall and would have gone right to where his wife was sleeping. You see, this brings me to a point about weather analysis and forecasting. And that is, how do you use the information somebody like me can provide? Well, I'm going to tell you how reliable it is first and then how to use it. What you've got here is where I derive most of my weather forecasting information. It comes from two major centers, the National Center for Environmental Prediction, their flagship metal called the GFS, okay? Stands for Global Forecasting System. And then we have the European Center, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting or the ECMWF, also commonly called the European model. These are the best two global weather forecasting centers on the planet bar none. And that's why I use them all the time. Statistically, the ECMWF is a superior model, and I can show you those statistics, but what I really want you to remember is this. You see, to answer that question, how do you use my weather information, you need to remember this figure. It's the accuracy or the skill of weather forecasting as a function of time. And you can see that through the next five, maybe seven or eight days, our ability to pinpoint your weather is relatively high. So how do you use it? You use the near-term weather forecast information to plan your operations. You plan out your week based upon weather, the timing of rainfall, the prediction of inversions, certain wind speeds, humidity levels, and you watch it during winter to know when we're gonna get those cold air outbreaks, big snowstorms, ice storms, and heavy rainfall. But you see, we call everything from day 10, ah, about day 10 to day 15, all the way out to day 45, no man's land. And we do that because we will never, and I do mean that, we will never be able, even with all the greatest computing technology and the most perfect weather observation systems that you could dream up, we will never be able to provide an accurate day-by-day -day weather forecast telling your exact high, exact low, the exact timing of precipitation out beyond about day 15 or 20. And the reason why is because the atmosphere is a chaotic system. It's nonlinear in its behavior. And therefore, to predict nonlinear systems is nearly impossible. You need a good example, try to predict the behavior of the stock market or try to predict the behavior of uh, corn and soybeans right now. Or how about trying to predict the price of GameStop or AMC when all of this chaos is going on? You see what I'm talking about? So what do we do out there at day 10 through day 120? We try to give you the best probabilistic information about the weather. What are the chances of being above average, or below average? We can do that and we're getting better and better and better at it every single day. So you use the near-term weather forecast information to plan your operations. You look at the long-term stuff to get a hint as to what the atmosphere could deliver and how it could affect your yield and productivity, but you never bet the farm on a forecast. So let's take a look at that long-term analysis. So far, I just thought you might like to see this. This is total snowfall that we've had so far this year. And you can see that through February 3rd, we've had a couple of systems come through the state of Tennessee. And a few of them put down a few inches of snow, especially over in eastern parts of Tennessee. But I find it more instructive to look at this data from this view. What you've got here is accumulated snowfall departure from average. 
So now we can see who's gotten the snow and who's not gotten it. And I'll tell you something, the fact that there's not much snow on the ground up here in the Northern Plains, in fact, there's none in parts of the high plains right up here in parts of uh, Western Dakotas and Montana. That cold air coming down could really do some damage on the wheat crop. We got a bit of a snow drought where I am from. I wish we could get some in here. And notice the, the dark colors representing the drier, or excuse me, the less than average snow that's on the other side of the Great Lakes. That tells you where we've not had the cold weather. Now you've seen the cold air that's coming through, but the question is how long does it last? Well, let's get to a long range analysis. You see, this is the forecast from mid-February through mid-March. Now, do you remember back earlier me telling you that with the cold air coming in like this, but some subtropical ridging happening right in through here, I drew a line straight through there saying that's going to be the battleground. From mid-February through mid-March, you can see exactly where we're expecting a very active Tennessee Valley and Ohio River Valley storm track. Get ready for it. You're going to sit on the border of where it's warm to your south and brutally cold to your north. What I don't like about this forecast is that, let me get those drawings off there. I'll show you. Ready? You get south of that line there. Drier than average conditions are forecast. And what did I show you a few moments ago? We already have drought in those areas. That means the likelihood of us correcting the drought situation moving forward in the Western United States is very limited. In fact, probably not gonna change at all. Now, before we go really long-term, we better talk about the other big fish right now and that's South America. Now I realize I've been going here for about 38 minutes. And I would like to, you to make sure you tune me back in to hear the next couple of things I'm about to share with you. 132 million metric ton. That's the projected soybean yield right now. Some folks are even higher than that, 133, 134. Where do we get that number? We just follow, going back over the last 44 years, the exponential growth in soybean production. Why is it exponential? Because their yield trend is linear. Why is the potential, excuse me, the, the production exponential? Every year, they have the ability to add somewhere between a million and this year, maybe as much as four million acres of new soybeans. I need to undo something that a lot of people are told that is incorrect about Brazil. Yes, in the 80s, there was a lot of deforestation of the Amazon, but not now. Nothing like it was. And the reason is that the Brazilian farmers know and understand thoroughly that we need to be keeping the Amazon healthy because it's critical for supplying moisture. So when I say they only farm 8% of their arable land and they're adding one to 4 million acres every year, they're getting it by converting pasture land over to farmland. And just so that you know, the state of Mato Grosso right here on my inset map, you could fit Texas inside of it. And Mato Grosso every year right now grows the equivalent of an Illinois plus an Iowa soybean crop. Now, thinking about that, you need to know this research. I'm going to summarize it very quickly. They need rains to return on the monsoon in September and October. The long-term research, which is shown to you here, you can see it right here and right here, is that something called the vapor pressure deficit is expanding their dry season. And through the month of October, over the last 40 years, we have seen a decline in October precipitation in Mato Grosso. Now, what does that mean? That means it's pushing their planting time period later and later, which then compresses their season and also makes them plant uh, the safrina crop later and later. And in 2020 to 2021, the state of Mato Grosso right here has been the driest in the last 40 years. I got them all right there over there on the, on the left for you. Now, you might be thinking it's the driest in 40 years and 30% of their soybeans are grown there. It's going to be a disaster. Sorry, it's not. And the reason why is even when it's very dry in Brazil, they can still get two to three inches of rain a week. They normally can get four to five. Where it's been wet has been in southern Brazil, and that's making up for some yield losses in northern Brazil and in eastern Brazil. It's also been wet in Argentina over the last month. In fact, to show you how wet it's been, take a look at the figure on the left first, the last two weeks. These colors up here go from six to 10 inches. And just in the last two weeks, you can see that southern Brazil and Argentina have seen a lot of rainfall. The video on the right is from Paraguay. The flooding there after 10 inches of rainfall has been just widespread. So they're almost dealing with too much rain south and not enough rain to the east. Well, quickly, so we can get onto this long range forecast, you can see where the drought is, but the wetter conditions are south. And that little place I just drew the hatched line over, 
that's about 70% of Brazil's soybean and corn production, uh, soybean production, okay? The rest of it's gonna be over here in Brazil's east stretching into Mato Grosso. Argentina looks dry, but lately they've got some big storms that rolled through to help out that soil moisture. Over the last few weeks, we have learned that they are on their slowest harvesting pace. And we expect that to be a 15 to 20 day delay to continue, which means our export markets are gonna to have to make up for that difference. So we've known this and been planning for it. But looking a little bit longer term, while over the next 10 days, they couldn't be any happier that they're gonna dry out in Southern Brazil. See the wetter conditions on the line I just drew here? That's the same place you're trying to harvest right now. And if it, over the next week, there's an additional one to four inches of rain on top of what is normal, which is three to five inches of rain, we're gonna be talking here about flooding and to keep those farmers out of the field, possibly delaying harvest even longer. And that's gonna delay when we put in the safrina corn and the safrina cotton. From here on out, from mid-February to mid-March, attention's gonna go south. Because if they go back over into drought conditions in Argentina, Southern Brazil, Uruguay, that could be a signal that during grain fill for that important crop in Argentina, they could have some trouble here with too dry conditions. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the weather premium coming out of South America that's already in our markets is going to be there for a while. All right, let's get back to it and finish this up. As we look longer term, this La Nina is going to be here for several more months. For those of us in the Midwest, so I'm talking about Illinois, Iowa, up to the Dakotas, we're worried about this area right here. Not the main push of colder air, which is over, or excuse me, colder water, which is there. We're worried about cold water showing up and staying in this area. Now, you shouldn't be as worried about it in Tennessee as we are in Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska. And that the reason for that is because if that cold water shows up and stays there as we get into spring, that's an early season indicator of drought for the Midwest. Now, more on that in a moment. This drought situation already occupies a big section of the Midwest. And the drought that's in parts of Nebraska the Dakotas, Minnesota, Western Iowa, it's going nowhere during winter. And the reason why? The soil's frozen. You can't get the moisture back into it anyways. But the likelihood of us continuing to look like this moving forward is high. Now, for you in the state of Tennessee, I want you to watch out for drought development early this spring from the lower Mississippi River Delta all the way to North Carolina. If that occurs, and we still have drought here over the four corner states, it's all going to target us and we're going to be in trouble going into the next year. But I just want to, I'll write it. This is all a big if statement here. We're waiting to see how this midwinter into early spring pattern really becomes established. So tonight, I really wish we had one more day on this conference, but tonight I'm going to get brand new long range updates. I'll put them on my weather forecast videos. I'll show you to go get those. Right now for the rest of February into March and April, the forecast is keeping that active Ohio River Valley storm track and drier conditions south of that line. The most mild weather will be over the southwest. And I believe this is biased, way too warm uh, in the current projected forecast for February, March, and April. I see good shots at colder air coming out of the Canadian prairie at time, hitting through the Midwest and eventually getting down toward the Ohio and Tennessee Valley. That's February, March, and April. There's support from this from what's called the National Multimodal Ensemble. Same time period, look at this, drier conditions south of that line, warmest conditions here, cold air when it comes out, comes out of the Canadian Prairie, but active Ohio River Valley storm track. There's another group called the IRI Multimodal Analysis Group. Do you see the same things? There's that active Ohio River Valley storm track. Here's the dryness to the south of that line, the greatest warmth in the southwest. Where's your cold gonna come from? the Canadian Prairie. Now in the state of Tennessee and to the South, I think we have a better likelihood of not of seeing a normal to even early spring. And the reason why is I keep seeing the subtropical ridge develop here. And if it develops there, that's one thing that keeps that cold air and buffers it from really invading our state. But if this spring is gonna get wet, we have to worry about the fact that that subtropical ridge in this area also guides weather systems that come like this right across the United States. The deep troughs that form here in the west, between that and the ridge over the southeast, just sets this area up right in through here for extremely wet conditions. Now, if we were gonna go over hot and dry for spring, 
Then we got to get something like this going, where the jet stream dives into the west, but then quickly retreats toward the Great Lakes. That puts a big ridge in place, and now all of a sudden we're seeing 80 degree temperatures in March. Here's the years where that happens. See it down here? So these are the two weather patterns that I'm going to be attempting to forecast as we go into spring. I got to get past this colder outbreak before we start to get a picture of what March, April, and May are going to look like. But I'm going to tell all of you, watch that subtropical ridge to become set up that could possibly influence our spring pattern. So what do we have right now for May, June, and July? Well, we see that the heat stays west, the big time heat. But notice, we're not looking at a cold start to the year so far. But I want to remind you, long range weather forecasting, the skill of this model is practically zero. But there is some, uh, there's some good meteorology in it. Remember where all the, dr the drought is right now in the west? They're forecasting that through early spring, it's going to stay there and rebuild. I hate to say this because I don't wish any harm on any farmer anywhere in the world. But if the west is hot and the west is burning, we're going to be doing just fine in the Midwest, getting to the Ohio River Valley and the Tennessee Valley. It's an unfortunate consequence of the way the atmosphere flows. If it's doing that, running over a big ridge in the West, we tend to have plenty of precipitation here in the Ohio River Valley, Tennessee Valley. May, June, and July. Remember I told you we're going to watch those ocean temperatures here? The current forecast at this point is for them to not go over cold. So now my concern becomes, if we have a fading La Nina, see that there, but warm water in the North Pacific and warm water in the North Atlantic, what does that do to that critical position of the Bermuda High? Let's talk about it. Because when we think about how this all works, variance in our yields for both corn and soybeans is ultimately in the state of Tennessee determined by two things. What's going on here with the Bermuda High? And then what's going on in the western part of the United States to redirect weather systems toward us? So let me show you what I mean here. Looking back over the last 100, let's see, 1895, that's how far back we're going to go here. During the 125-year time period, the primary corn and soybean belt, and Tennessee is included in this, we've seen an increase in total precipitation. Yet we still have big drought years that happen. I just circled 2012 and 1988, but here's 1976. You can see these years going back in time. Thinking about that, I want to know what robs us of yield in the Midwest first, and then we'll come over to Tennessee as I wrap up my talk today. These time periods, which I've identified here, where all of a sudden in June, July, and August, we get scorched with the flash drought situation. Well, there's a telltale sign that that's going to happen. Here it is. Ready? If we're not going to see drought, if we're going to see beautiful weather, watch right here in the Gulf of Alaska and just into British Columbia. If a big ridge sets up there, the west goes hot, but a trough dives into the Great Lakes states. Routine weather systems, open Gulf of Mexico moisture transport, and we're in business. That's what would give us bin busting yields in the Midwest. And like I said, cold water here is a problem. Warm water here, Midwesterners love El Nino because it cranks up our moisture in the Midwest. Look at the flip side of this. Our lowest yielding years build a huge ridge right here. Now I'm talking about the Midwest, build a huge ridge over Wisconsin, Minnesota. The jet stream runs down over the West Coast and builds like this and shuts down all that Gulf of Mexico moisture transport. There is a negative 0.6 correlation right here with ocean temperatures and heat and drought in the Midwest. So what about Tennessee? You don't want the Bermuda High to move to Memphis. If the Bermuda High moves to Memphis, we are absolutely done and scorched and hot. You can see the years down here that make up this list. It's a disaster for us. Now, can I forecast the position of the Bermuda High in summer today? Absolutely not. I got to watch it every day from now until June and July and August to see where it's going to be. That's why I shared with you the limits of predictability. But thinking about all of this, I do want to put it into the context of our longer term statistics. Now, I've been focusing on the Midwest. Let's start there. In the primary corn and soybean belt, April to October, we have added over the last 70 years, on average, five and a half inches to our growing season. That's what's helping productivity stay so high and making droughts few and far between. 
Iowa has tripled the number of heavy rainfall events defined as two inches of rainfall or more in a 24 hour time period. And my home state of Illinois has doubled that number, which means our rainfall is getting delivered more and more in big helpings followed by longer stretches of drier weather. What about Tennessee? Through Tennessee, April to October, we've increased our rainfall six inches on average over the last 70 years. And we've doubled the frequency of our big rainfall events. Now, why I tell you all of this as I start to wrap up today is the key to success in the future management of our crops boils down to water and water management. This is not how you do it. I've been showing this video now for a year. It's one of my favorites. This young man, clearly excited to be throwing five gallon buckets of water over a fence with holes in it, is not taking care of his water problem. To be sustainable in agriculture is to manage soil health. Because when weather throws in the wild card, the healthier your soil, the greatest it will resist erosion. It will resist nutrient loss. It will resist the problems that come from flood and drought. That's my key message as I finish this up. And if you'll give me two more minutes, I'm gonna make this a really good take home point that you can talk about over lunch, all right? Here's my last story. Remember the Dust Bowl of the 1930s? People were given land, like I talked about earlier, the Homestead Act. Move west, here's 160 acres, plow it up, grow grain, pay taxes, here it is for free. Problem was, from the late 1800s to the early 1930s, drought, when it happened, was typically short-lived. But in the 1930s, a long-standing drought built in the Midwest into the Great Plains. And we exacerbated it with terrible soil management. You see, what we didn't know then was that the common thought about managing your soil to prevent erosion was to plow, recreationally plow, plow any time you could, plow often. If you got a rain and you don't have a crop in the field, plow, get that soil turned over so that you can store that water. But what we didn't know is we were destroying the soil integrity. In the 1930s, when the socioeconomic crisis of the Dust Bowl hit, the dust began to blow. Now, this particular event was incredible. And these dust storms stretched the entirety of the Great Plains. Here's one viewed from an airplane just showing you what that dust looked like. These dust storms raged across the central part of the United States for years on end. The worst one was called Black Sunday, April 14th, 1935. That dust storm made it all the way to the East Coast. Here's just a couple of pictures from it. And they stretched clear all the way up to the northern plains of the United States. Now, while this was going on, a giant arose in the middle of this dust storm, a giant in soil conservation. And I want to tell you his story here in my last little bit. Hugh Bennett. You see, Hugh Bennett learned from his father and grandfather that the practices in place in the Midwest, where the U.S. government told those Midwestern farmers and those Great Plain farmers that the soil was indestructible and inexhaustible. That's a quote, by the way. He learned that it wasn't. He learned that the practices we had in place were not working for the soil. He used cover crops before cover crops were cool. He did no-till before no-till was a, a scientific practice. And he was very good about managing his soil. Now, he wanted to tell everybody about his research, so he did. He started going all over the country, telling farmers, talking to lo far local farmer groups, state governments, and he actually got an audience with the United States Senate to talk about how land management in the Midwest and in the Great Plains was failing them, turning our bread basket into a dust bowl. Now, when you look at it here, that quote over there on the right was from a book called The Worst Hard Time, and it said from Hugh Bennett, that when the people along the Eastern seaboard began to taste the fresh soil from the plains 2000 miles away, many of them for the first time realized that somewhere, something had gone wrong with the land. And he got an audience with Congress five days after the black blizzard of 1935 on April 15th. Now, this is the story we're gonna finish with. Hugh Bennett in front of the Senate did what I would have done. He's a scientist. He showed charts and graphs and data and statistics and said, this is what's happening in the plains. You're going to lose the breadbasket if we don't do something different. And you know what the senators did? Their thought was we got bigger fish to fry. We're in the middle of the Great Depression. And they fell asleep during his testimony. Now, listen up. In the middle of his testimony, one of Hugh Bennett's aides 
tugged on his pant leg and said, Hugh, we just got a report that coming from Kansas and Oklahoma, went over the Mid-South, hit Tennessee, it's over the Appalachian Mountains. One of these dust storms is coming to Washington, D.C. The report said it'll be here in an hour. Hugh looked down and knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to stall. Now, we know about stalling in the Senate, right? As those senators slept, Hugh Bennett over the next hour built his talk into this massive crescendo as one of these huge dust storms encroached on the city. And as it got closer and closer, the sky began to look something like this. And those sleeping senators woke up to walk over to the windows and look outside and see the sky getting this coppery hue getting darker and darker. Now he watched them all walk over there and he followed them. And as they were standing in amazement, tasting the soil from the Great Plains, he waited for the perfect moment when all was quiet. And he said, this gentleman is what I'm talking about. There goes Oklahoma. And those senators turned around and I imagine they looked right at Hugh Bennett and got the big picture. Because the next day we founded and fully funded the U.S. Soil Conservation Service. And by the way, we call that now NRCS. Now, what a cool story about sustainable agriculture and its beginnings. And by the way, the video you've been watching from Kansas, this was back on January 15th. See this big cyclone here? On the back side of it, a big dust storm came out of Colorado. I got a satellite animation of it right here. It stretched from Colorado through Western Kansas, through the Panhandles, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And that massive dust storm there is a result of drought that's ongoing right now in the Western part of the United States. And that's why today I focus so much on that. So thinking about all of this, one last thing to share with you. Back in the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, we got a bunch of ship reports. And it turns out that what helped that drought along was cool water right here. See those connections? This is why we try to forecast the long-term weather by looking at these historical